Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer here today, and today I'm going to be playing episode 3 in my Ultiman General Gettysburg Let's Play. Uh, in this video I'm going to be playing the third battle in this series. Uh, now the one thing to keep in mind with Ultimate General is when you play a campaign through the Battle of Gettysburg, your previous battles are what determine your next battle. So what happened on the previous battle determines what happens on the next battle. There's over 30 different scenarios, so there's a lot of flexibility based on what happens on the map, and the game seems to do a very good job of having carryover. It also seems to have carryover casualties as well, which make all of your strategic and tactical decisions uh, relevant as far as your ability to continue to fight on the next day. Uh, so, so so far, we are on the third battle. The first battle saw us take Oak Hill and Oak Ridge. Uh, we didn't take Cemetery Ridge. The second battle saw us take Cemetery Ridge and also Culp's Hill. Uh, so now we are in the third battle, which is taking place late in the day. It's about, oh... 325 so it seems time doesn't seem to progress totally logically in that it's the last battle ended at 1630 I think so we're jumping backwards in time about an hour um, but anyway uh, you can see here the Confederacy is about 21,000 soldiers we start off at a numerical advantage against the Union only is about 13,512 left uh, and they have 9,700 reinforcements that are on the way probably part of Slocum's Corps but uh, we took Culp's Hill, we took Cemetery Ridge in the last battle, so the scenario now says that the Union have been forced into Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill, and we are pursuing them. We should make a decisive assault on their remaining positions and force them off while we still have the momentum, General. Our forces are deployed to attack Cemetery from three directions and pressure the enemy heavily. There's little more beyond that. We must launch an attack with high impact and dig them out of their holes. Best of luck, General. So we've had more success early in the first day of Gettysburg. Uh, we successfully pushed the Union back further than we did historically on Cemetery Ridge early in the day. In the middle of the day, we had more success uh, in that we took Cemetery Ridge, and we also, which was historical, and then also took Culp's Hill, which was something that the Confederacy never took. And now we are into the last battle here, probably, I would imagine, for the day. Maybe one more. We've got Culp's Hill up here, which we've taken, which is right astride of the Union supply line, which kind of follows this road up north, so the Union flank is really exposed. Now, our position on Culp's Hill is somewhat tenuous. Um, you can see here we've only got about three brigades. Uh, they haven't lost much in the way of casualties, but if I was the Union, I would counterattack them heavily and quickly. So I'm actually going to move some reinforcements down right away. I'm going to get some artillery up on Culp's Hill. And hopefully they'll arrive in time uh, before the Union decides to launch another attack. But hopefully those 1,300 re reinforcements that I'm sending under Gordon uh, can stop what looks like Bucktail's Brigade, who will probably come up here and counterattack us, I would imagine. Uh, again, if I was the AI, that's definitely what I would be doing. Um, you can see here we've got very good cover and terrain, though, so I'm hoping... Hoping we can survive. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to launch an attack from Culp's Hill, though, with the enemy diverting troops. Now, where we have the advantage is probably across here near Cemetery Ridge and Culp's Hill, uh, or Cemetery, Cemetery Hill, where we've got the bulk of our force deployed opposite of it. So we're trying to have a historical result where we have a successful assault on the enemy, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to attack straight across. I'm not going to be very creative about it. I'm just going to launch essentially a frontal assault. It's almost like launching Pickett's Charge here on the first day of the battle. Again, you can see there's carryover casualties because these little skulls represent how many casualties have been lost thus far in the battle. And uh, all these units are uh, definitely losing, ca have lost casualties already. Uh, moving my artillery up here to support. And we're just going to go ahead and... Uh, Launch our attack. Again, I'm moving Gordon here. It's kind of an open terrain, but I want to protect Culp's flank. The Union has about 9,000 soldiers. You can see there's the 11th Corps here and the 1st Corps here for the Union. Uh, the 11th under General Howard. The 1st would be under Reynolds, although if he died as he did historically early in the day, I believe Doubleday was commanding it later in the day. Uh, we've got our 2nd Corps under General Ewell, uh, who was heavily criticized for his poor performance on the first day in... Uh, basically not being aggressive enough and pushing the Union back when he had a chance. And we've got General Hill, who is actually suffering, I believe, I want to say he was suffering from, um, oh, I can't think of it. What's that sexually transmitted disease? Uh, penicillin cures it. Syphilis. I believe he was suffering from syphilis at the time. Um, and there was supposedly a bit of animosity between him and General Lee over his life choices that caused him to get it. Um, basically that he wasn't faithful? I don't know. Um, but that's what I remember reading somewhere, so take that for what it is. 
All right, we might be able to launch an attack now here from that other flank. Again, I don't think... There's no way these brigades are going to push back um, all of these soldiers up here. Uh, but we might be able to kind of hold our position. Again, if the Union has reinforcements coming up, that could be a problem. They're probably coming from the Union 12th Corps, uh, which is made up of General Slocum's command, who is the oldest uh, general in the Union Army uh, in command of a corps at this time, I believe. Take that for what it is. You can see here uh, the enemy does have troops along my flank, along uh, Cemetery Ridge. So I don't know why you're turning to expose your own flank. That seems pretty risky. But maybe we can get along the stone wall. I'm not sure how much how much cover those offer in terms of the game. Not quite sure. My artillery must not be in range. Not quite accurate. You can definitely be in range from there. Maybe not line of sight. I'm not sure. So this is right along the same area, again, that Pickett's Charge took place on July 3rd. This is the stone wall that the Union famously held up against, uh, against uh, the 15,000 Confederates moving against open ground. The difference here in this case right now is the fact that our soldiers are, while they're marching across the open ground, the Union had over 100 artillery pieces that were firing into the Confederates uh, for over, you know, 20 minutes as they walked across that open mile of open terrain. Our troops don't have to deal with that right now. Actually, historically, the Confederates got up onto Cemetery Ridge, or Cemetery Hill, on July 1st, the night of. Um, only a regiment or two got up there, but uh, they were able to get along there largely due to, you know, night and good cover. So hopefully we can take Cemetery Hill. I don't know if we'll be able to take Cemetery Ridge, but I guess we'll see. See how the map kind of adjusts too. Uh, it seems like it's one giant map that just kind of slowly scrolls as you advance further along, which is kind of cool. Some of my regiments are really fought out by now though. Some of them have lost, you know, hundreds and hundreds. Pettigrew's here has lost over 50% of his soldiers here. Um, and that definitely is gonna have an impact on their ability to fight effectively. Again, I would think these artillery pieces would be able to support from this ridge, but apparently not. I guess we're going to have to move them forward to support. So we'll go ahead and do that and move them into this open terrain. I don't know if I'm going to be able to take this ridge or not. It's too early to tell, but it seems like the enemy's got quite a strong defense to their front. Now, as I was talking about at the end of the last video, the 11th Corps, which makes up the Union right flank here, as uh, so you can tell from some of these names, von Glees, uh, Kursowski, Schlefrem, Begin, was a large percent, and I can't pronounce German names, despite being somewhat German myself, um, was a large percentage of uh, foreign-born German soldiers uh, fought for the United States in uh, the 11th Corps. Many of them came over as a result of the uh, instability that was occurring in Germany. It was not a country at the time. Germany was made up of several hundred different principalities and, and city-states and kingdoms uh, at the time. But there was a large uh, group of rebellions and, and dissent which occurred in 1848 and many of those uh, people who had been basically exiled from Germany as a result of that descent fled to the United States and uh, became immigrants there and, you, you know, took the United States on as their adopted country. Similar to many Irish who came over during the potato famine and fought uh, for the United States during the uh, Civil War as well. Now, a large percentage of those ended up in units which were positioned into the 11th Corps. So it was a disproportionately large uh, body of German soldiers uh, versus... Um, you know, a, a more mixed uh, group. That made them easy to become scapegoats by native, if you will, uh, nativists, um, or, you know, native-born Americans, um, not Native Americans, who um, basically it made them scapegoats. There was a large uh, upswing in the years prior to the Civil War of anti-immigration, um, kind of similar to what you see these days in the United States today. There was a, a similar movement, actually. There was a political party which was very opposed to immigration. They were called the Know Nothing Party, and they um, grew to prominence in the 1850s. They kind of died off or, or were kind of, you know, 
put into kind of the background uh, by the 1860s, but there were still a lot of people around there that had those sort of same sentiments or were very hostile against immigrants. So even though these German soldiers were fighting uh, for the, uni the Union and for uh, many of these people's political you know, beliefs, um, they were easily scapegoated and blamed for problems. And what happened at the Battle of Chancellorsville was the Union 11th Corps was placed along the end of the Union line. General Jackson marched a corps of Confederate soldiers around the Union position, flanked, surprised, and routed the 11th Corps from the field. Uh, now this was undoubtedly, you know, this unit was defeated on the field of battle, so you can certainly blame them for that. Uh, but whether their position that, that made them vulnerable to this, or whether it was really their fault, that's a little more ambiguous. You could blame the army commanders. Certainly, they're responsible for any um, any battle in which the army was being fought. So you could blame General Hooker, who was in command. Um, you could also blame General Howard, who was not German, but who commanded the 11th Corps. And you could blame the soldiers. Um, you know, anytime a flank is attacked, it's going to be difficult for you to uh, withstand that. A flank attack is when a enemy attacks the end of your line so you know these couple of guys here on the end if a large line of troops are all firing into you and you can only respond with three or four muskets you know it's a, a, a limited example just based on what we see here on, on the screen um, it's going to be difficult for you to withstand that attack now there are ways to prevent it obviously you want scouts and pickets and other things out there to detect it uh, general sickles actually uh, spotted General Jackson's soldiers as they were marching, but there was nothing done about it. So there were reasons, there were reports that indicated this was happening, and, and a lot of it was disregarded, a lot of it was perhaps missed in the confusion of battle. And um, when the attack occurred and the Union was routed and Chancellorsville turned into a disaster for the Union Army as they were nearly completely destroyed, there was a risk of it at one point. Um, the 11th Corps was blamed because they were the soldiers, and it makes sense, they were the soldiers there fighting who were driven from the field, so it makes sense to blame them for the failure. Now, um, fast forward two months to the Battle of Gettysburg, something very similar happened on the first day. The Union Corps was actually out here fighting on Seminary Ridge, the first Union Corps under General Reynolds, and they were fighting admirably. Uh, the Union 11th Corps came in second on the field and arrived and were deployed along here, along this very open hard to defend territory and then by sheer luck the confederate second corps was coming down a road almost behind their lines and again drove the union 11th from the field now some of this is bad luck you know the fact that the road just happens to come in right behind your own line that the enemy is coming on the field of battle that's hard to be your fault um you can't control the roads and the corps was already overextended the position that they were on uh, was simply too long of a position for a force that large to, to be holding. Um, but there weren't any other troops, so it was kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't, uh, and they happened to be defeated and driven from the field. So what ended up happening was, again, the Union media uh, largely blamed them for the near disaster on July 1st, and even though Gettysburg turned into a Union victory, there was still a lot of negative press, which was, uh, you know, which was put at the feet of the 11th Corps. They were kind of the, the villains, the, the poor soldiers. They were, um, again, the scapegoats for the failings of the, of, of the army there and uh, got a lot of the flack for that. As you can see, I'm driving the Union from the field pretty substantially, uh, pretty easily at this point in time. They do have 9,000 reinforcements, or, which are supposed to be coming. I don't think I've seen them yet. But anyway, so they were, they were blamed for the failures. And... In 1864, the Confederacies, uh, a couple of months later, uh, maybe about six months later, I think. No, it was later in 1863. Uh, the, un the Confederates won a large battle at the Battle of Chickamauga, drove north into Tennessee and besieged Chattanooga, which was previously under Union control, and the Union needed reinforcements there. And the Union uh, rushed 20,000 soldiers by rail from the Eastern Theater to the Western Theater. And it was what the biggest grouping of these soldiers was part of the 11th Corps. It was shifted from the Army of the Potomac, where a large percentage of the soldiers really hated these German soldiers for various reasons. Um, but they basically they hated these soldiers, so they shifted these guys basically out of sight, out of mind. It's kind of it was kind of like sending a German soldier during World War II to the Eastern Front. It, you know, it was important. It was bloody. It was strategically more important than the Eastern Front in the United States from, you know, the, the result of the war, but uh, 
there were def definitely political considerations taken into account when they sent these soldiers there. They could have sent any corps they sent the 11th, most likely uh, for political reasons. What I find interesting is a lot of the German soldiers, and I'm not trying to play these, these soldiers up as perfect or, you know, all being, they, they were obviously defeated several times. Again, whether it was their own fault, whether it was any individual soldier's fault, or any group of individual soldiers' fault with the result of a battle is hard to say, especially in this era of warfare where so much of it relied on the generals. Um, there weren't small unit actions where individual squads of men could, you know, could could decide the fate of the battle. A regiment of several hundred men, sure, but they've got to be in the right place. Linear warfare is very, very demanding on the, the, the officers in charge in terms of, you know, their impact on the actual result of the battle. But anyway, so they were sent, they were sent out that way, and I find it interesting, uh, for my senior thesis in college, I actually wrote on this, I find it interesting that the German immigrants, from what I have seen, and, and granted, I you know, I, I definitely haven't read every diary out there or every article out there from these German soldiers. But it seemed that while the soldiers resented um, treatment from uh, native-born Americans, uh, they didn't take it out against their country. It very rarely did it seem like any of them were stating that uh, they regretted coming here, that they held the United States as a poor place, that they, you know, regretted their decision to fight. Very few of them seemed to say that the, the war wasn't worth fighting. Very few of them seemed to get the sense that, oh, I made a mistake in joining up. They almost all still believed that the war was, was worth fighting and that they should be fighting it and that they wanted to continue fighting it uh, from what I've seen. They definitely criticized the media. It was almost today like you see a lot of conservative groups, uh, like them or dislike them, who label the, the media as, as a liberally controlled media where they say, oh, the, you know, the liberal media, it's a, I don't know, it, you know, they're, they're making up a conspiracy or they're making us look bad or whatever. And it's almost like there was that sense of it's all the media's fault, but, you know, this is still a great country. That's kind of the, the direction that the, the German soldiers that I was able to, to research and get their information on took, which I find interesting because you would think you'd have a backlash. You'd think you'd be angry at people if you got a lot of hate for something that you didn't feel was your fault or didn't feel was in your control. Um, you would think you would kind of press blame on someone else. And it was really amazing that a lot of these soldiers really kind of just took it in stride and just sort of said, you know, it is what it is, and it's it's not our fault. It is the, the media's fault, but we're not going to hold the country responsible. We're not going to label all Americans as this. Um, and it didn't, it didn't seem to make them, you know, draw in and, and isolate themselves any more than they already were. I mean, they were largely German-speaking soldiers, so they weren't, you know, uh, talking it up in English a whole lot, but it, it just wasn't, I guess it, it was impressive, I would say, for a group of soldiers who was really persecuted for a lot of the war uh, in any theater that they fought to react the way they did to the circumstances that they were put in. Uh, I guess that I find that interesting. Um, but anyway, as you can see here, I won an epic victory. Uh, that's the best victory I've won so far. We took every single objective. The Union had no, you know, no objectives that they held. This is the first battle where we inflicted substantially more casualties on the enemy, more than just a few dozen, you know, more on them than they on us. We lost about 1,900 soldiers. The enemy lost about 2,800 soldiers. So uh, that should probably give us a huge advantage, I would imagine, moving into day two. It would now be about 7.30, so maybe we've got time for one more fight on July 1st. Let's see. Okay, so we've got we've got a strategy decision that we need to make. We need to decide whether we're going to crush the Yankees or whether we're going to rest our army and wait for reinforcements to arrive. Um, I just want to make sure if I do this, I can, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to end the video here, and you're going to have to check in on the next video. You're going to have to check in on part four to see what I decide. Am I going to launch a night attack on the end of July 1st to crush the Union Army and rout them from the field and win a decisive victory at Gettysburg immediately? Or am I going to wait for reinforcements to come up? What should I do? If you think I should crush the Yankees, throw it in the description or throw it in the comments. Let me know. If you think I should wait for reinforcements and be prudent and more cautious uh, to allow me to have a better chance of defeating the enemy rather than taking serious risks at losing a huge part of my army, 
then throw that in the descript not description throw it in the in the comments let me know send me a message follow me on twitter uh, at historical gamer um or whatever you know general marketing slogans here <laughs> thank you for tuning in though i appreciate you watching uh again i do appreciate those likes those subscriptions and uh if there's anything else you'd like to see me cover any other games or anything in particular about this game you'd like to see let me know until next time this is the historical gamer saying thank you for watching and i'm out